Tuesday and Wednesday of this week will be the first lecture of the fertilizer series. Then next Monday, next Monday we'll have uh, the Monday section will get their first one, and Tuesday and Wednesday will get their second. They'll get their second and final lecture in this fertilizer series. But then the Monday section, the following week, is cut out because of the holiday. So those of you who have Monday lab, how many will not be able to make either Tuesday or Wednesday of next week? Well, I don't know what you're going to do about it then. <laughs> you can't make either Tuesday or Wednesday. We very hurriedly finished up this uh, third type of thinning. Remember we said we had flower cluster thinning in which you take off the flowers as soon as you can see them. And uh, this was to increase the number of leaves per cluster left to give you a better uh, nutrition of the flowers to, to get a better set on varieties in which you might have problem with set. And then we had the second type of thinning in which um, you just remove uh, clusters after bloom and after bloom is important. And this is just to reduce crop load. And then, uh, boy, I left a set of notes back there. I left out the rest of that lecture. I'm Allie, you think you can find my lecture notes? <laughs> I don't think you can um, in my office. I either take five minutes and run and get them, or uh, I skip that lecture completely here. I think I can get them better than he can, so why don't you just relax for five minutes and let me run and get them, because I thought I'd finish that complete thinning and their effects from the flower cluster thinning to the removal of whole clusters just to lighten the load. And then finally, this matter of removing parts of the clusters in order to uh, prevent uh, bunch rot and tight clusters. So after doing that review, then we can go down to uh, the discussion of some training, pruning, and thinning recommendations for particular varieties. And of course, we should start out here then with with all this thinning, talking about table grapes. And again, getting back to tying it in with this type of thinning and why we do it, we have first to discuss the varieties in which we do get poor set. And I gave you some examples before, as so far as flower cluster thinning. But varieties in which we get poor set would be the Muscat of Alexandria, Riviere, and Cardinal. I gave you those last time so far as thinning. Now let's go back and put the whole package together so far as the whole uh, combination is concerned. Now I told you on muscat that we would normally recommend head training of muscat and long spur. That would be three to four buds if you're going to grow up for table fruit. We're talking now about table fruit. So you would, the recommendation would be to head train it because of its weakness. Uh, it's debatable whether or not you could put it on cordon, but uh, the recommendation would be to head train these three to four bud spurs, so-called long, long spur. And flower cluster thin, rather severely to thin it down to about one cluster per shoot and maybe two shoots per spur when you got through with it. Now, on Rubier and Cardinal, you can treat those both the same. This, you'd short spur it, that'd be a one to two buds, one to two buds, or quite often what I refer to as a one plus, that question mark of whether or not you have it. Because of the extreme fruitfulness, but you still have to do something to increase set. So you prune it, you put it on a cordon. Excuse me, I want to follow the procedure. You cordon, cordon train these. They're vigorous varieties. They're large clustered. 
and they're table proof. So on all three bases, they should be cordon trained and, of course, put on uh, a cross arm trellis. And they leave one to two buds, or this one plus is an average. And again, flower cluster thin, increased set. Now, what we really do with these varieties is where we severely flower cluster thin muscat. On these, you flower cluster thin down to leave yourself about a 10% bonus. In other words, you, you thin down to generally one cluster per shoot. But on the stronger shoots, those at the, at the shoulders of the cordon, um, and now out here at the tip, you might leave several situations in which you leave two clusters per shoot. So that, in other words, you thin down to about 10 or 20% more crop than you want. In the, in the final leaves you treat the same way we're talking about those table thompsons. You're going to thin these down to something like 20 to 30 clusters final because they are table fruit. So if you're going to have somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 to 30 clusters in the, in the end, you want to flower cluster down to something like 25 to 40 to improve the set. You see, the set isn't so terribly important. It isn't so difficult to get the set there as it is on the muscat. So you thin down just above the point of where you want to stop and then go back after they bloom and after the berries have set and do that second type of thinning in which you remove about 10% more of the clusters. In this case, you're taking off the ones that are close to the wire and the misshapen ones and the oversized ones and so forth, just to essentially what you're doing is to select your clusters to put in the box at that time rather than when they get ripe. So why leave a bunch of stuff on there that it's just going to uh, tend to overcrop your vine and you're going to send it to the winery anyway at $40 or $50 a ton at the end of the year. So with Cardinal then and Rebeer, you'd have this short spur. And then occasionally, as I say, in some areas, you sometimes have trouble with red Malaga. And it would be cordon trained and long spur, the same as the muscat, something like this. If you have trouble with set, only in places where you have trouble with set, Red Malaga would be treated the same way as muscat. That is, leaving long spurs, three to four buds, and do the flower cluster thinning, if you have problem with it. Say, South Africa, some places in California, so in a few places, we have trouble getting a proper set with Red Malaga. But it would be cordon trained and spur prune regardless. And the flower cluster thinned, depending on how much problem you have with set. Yes? No, I said that, uh, I said head train here is more standard, but it's questionable whether or not you can put it on. If you put it on cordon, you're going to have to baby it some, at least in the first few years. And uh, as you know, down in your area, more of it's on uh, cordon than on head train, even though the recommendation would normally go for head training. And of course, we get around then to this one, which I always had to pull up the last thousand acres so I don't have to talk about it all the time, Almeria which is the overhead trellis. And to that one, of course, you put on, it's the one we have the most difficulty with getting set of all. When it comes around to this male and female vine business, it tends to be so female in nature that the pollen, it's questionable whether pollen is viable at all or not. Whether or not you get the set entirely by uh, a little bit of wind pollination. We'll discuss all this in the spring quarter. But, uh, we do everything in the world to increase the set on it. We put on overhead arbor to give lots of old wood, up high, big trunks, like the winter vine. Then we leave canes on that, and then severely flower cluster thin. And then, even then, interplant with emperor or, or <coughs> rebeer or something to try to get some additional pollen. Because we do all this to try to nourish the flower parts, either the stigma or the female part, or in this case, the male part, the pollen, the stainless to develop and the pollen develop properly. And even with this, we still, uh, the general practice is to interplant with emperor, which ripens more or less at the same time. Well, you ask, why did we do all this problem with a, with a grape such as this? Uh, back about the time you were born, about the time I was born, uh, they didn't have such good refrigeration and shipping. And of course, the big deal then about table grapes is far more important to uh, plant grapes that ripened, 
periodically during the growing season rather than work and then the count on refrigeration to hold them. And Almeria is our latest table grape to get ripe, even a little bit later than Emperor. They pick them both about the same time, but if you had to argue about it, you'd say that, that uh, Almeria comes in a week or so later than Emperor. And this made it, it this extended the growing season uh, well into around Thanksgiving time down in the Delano area. But now that we've got refrigeration and uh, sterilization, SO2 and all this worked out to the fine degree that we have, I really wonder why we still grow Almeria in California. Uh, Emperor, Emperor goes into the season late enough so that you really don't need to worry about it. Of course, Almeria is a green grape. For those of you who don't know it, it looked like a Thompson seedless with <coughs> seeds, a little darker green than Thompson seedless but it still has seeds. Those of you took 105, of course, are familiar with it. And it's a good late winter, early, uh, I mean late in the year, calendar year, November, December, January, February, grape. But we only grow about 1,000 or so acres of it, but I have to continually refer to it in this class because it is one, the, one exception. It's an important grape in Spain, of course, and important in South America, but not too important here anymore. While I'm talking about this matter of, of, of uh, breeding grapes, and our cold storage uh, improvements. You know that, of course, you never stop to think about it, but you can get table grapes every week of the year in California. Uh, in fact, they overlap uh, uh, nearly every year. The first grapes go out of Coachella Valley along about the same week or several weeks of the last shipments of the emperors. So you get a complete overlap of shipping of grapes out of California because they can hold emperors picked Emperor's and uh, Almeria picked in uh, late October, early November, and hold those over until May of the following year when the uh, first perlets come in from Coachella Valley. So we do, we do have this, this round the year, round the clock availability of fresh table grapes, which you may sometimes never stop to think about. Well, in the same group, but only for those of you who uh, are interested in, we'd have the uh, Dottie which is, uh, again, even, isn't even an important grape in California at all, but we have foreign students sometimes in here. This is the Waltham Cross of, uh, uh, of South Africa, and it also has some problems to set, and we would, would long spur it on a cordon and flower cluster tenant treating it the same way as Muscat. So Muscat, Dadier, and Almeria would all be treated the same way. Uh, as so far as the three and four bud spurs and doing the flower cluster thinning. Rebeer and Cardinal are the two exceptions in which being a table grape where you want lots of leaf surface and in proportion to the clusters, uh, you'd think that you leave lots of buds, but remember you don't leave lots of buds because of this terrific added expense of thinning. Uh, all right, then we go to that second type of, of uh, uh, second type of variety and that is those that produce normal fruit with normal pruning. Varieties that produce normal fruit with normal pruning, we're still talking about table grapes. And this would take care of uh, uh, most of the rest of the ones that are of importance. Uh, white Malaga used to be an important table grape, but uh, that was again 30 or 40 years ago, and not much of it is sold as table fruit now. It's the ones that are left are pretty old, and they're being used mostly for just distilling material, but white Malaga is important in some areas, such as Mexico, for example. And this is a very vigorous growing variety, and we would uh, put it on cordon, large cluster again, cordon, and long spur it, and do the, uh, we would not do now, remember we would not do any flower cluster thinning in this group, because these set normally, they set you a normal cluster. So you just do cl uh, cluster thinning, taking off entire clusters to reduce the crop load, and do some berry thinning, that is cutting off parts of clusters. And if you flower cluster, this, uh, flower cluster thin this variety, you would be in trouble. It'd be too tight. A more important variety from your standpoint in table fruit would be Italia, a muscat type grape, which uh, uh, sets, sets very well compared to the muscat. And if you do not overcrop it, you can get a very light muscat flavor to it. But the problem is that people grow Italia as a substitute for muscat and then overcrop it, 
and it wipes out the muscat flavor, so you might just have to go white mouth. <laughs> but uh, anyway, that's the way it should be done. It should be, uh, uh, Italia should be uh, long spur pruned on cordon, and then a very good job of thinning the clusters out. And you might put in that comment for your own notes that unless you do thin it down to something under perhaps even a, a normal maturing crop, you will not get much muscat flavor. And then we have emperor that, that falls into this uh, group. Emperor being a table variety, vigorous. We'd put that on cordon training and long spur it because of the uh, generally or relatively low cluster formation on this variety. Normally, for that reason, then we would not have to do much thinning. Now, we say cordon train it and long spur it, but a very common uh, practice in the in the emperor area is to have these long, uh, for, for brevity, we just show it this way, and then out at the end, have a short cane, just a short cane long enough just barely to reach the wire. In other words, a, long, a real long spur or a cane here of something like uh, maybe only six to eight buds on each side, just to give you more buds because these buds are so, lo so relatively low in fruitfulness. Generally, I say, unless we're going to get down to really, you're, you're going to get down to growing emperor, you can just say you'd cordon train it and long spur it. And if you're driving down the valley and you see some of these old vines in which they're cordon trained and these arms are getting quite long, you can be pretty sure, as I was traveling around the other day, that they're emperors because whereas Tokay and some of these other varieties throw water sprouts fairly well so that you can replace those arms, emperor is a very, not only is it relatively low in fruitfulness of its buds, it's relatively low in pushing water sprouts too. So sometimes you have a hard time uh, replacing these arms, so they tend to get rather long and, and uh, fouled up on, in the commercial vineyard. All right, that's enough examples of that type. Then we get to the third type of varieties which produce <coughs> clusters that are too compact. Varieties that produce clusters that are too compact. And you know then what we're going to do here. For example, the best ones under this, the two most important ones of all would be toque. And the toque we would cordon train, recommended for cordon training, and normal spur. So it'd be cordon, normal spur, and by that we mean two to three buds, spurs, and do a good job of cluster thinning after the bloom is over to lighten the crop load because once again you're working on table fruit so you would do a, com a combination of cluster thinning taking out entire clusters but since we're talking about the, the category in which the clusters get too tight you would also cut off the clusters as I showed you very hastily at the end of the last class you'd cut off that bottom half in order to prevent uh, over compactness of the clusters so you have two types of thinning there both done at the same time by the same guy but, uh, the, two, but uh, the purpose for why you, why you do them, the reason why you do them is different. You take off whole, whole clusters to lighten the crop load, but you take off half of each cluster or more than half of each cluster to prevent this compactness. And that would also apply to Thompson seedless where you're growing it for table fruit. See, we have to distinguish here. If you're growing Thompson seedless for raisins or wine, then you don't worry about them being too compact. They don't get tight enough to burst berries and so forth. You get a rather full cluster down at that tip, but you don't get berries so large that you get cracked berries or get knobby clusters that you can knock a guy out with. But if you're going to grow Thompson seedless for table fruit, you either girdle it or thin it or hormone it or all three, all three of which combined together triple the size of the berry triple the size of the berry. So if you're going to triple the size of the berry, something's got to give. So you've got to cut off the bottom half or two-thirds of the cluster so that you're working with those long branches up there at the top that can spread out as the berries grow. You get down on, low down on the, uh, on the cluster and you've got little short stems that are only uh, about a half inch long and there's no way for them to spread apart and give you a space for the berries. So if you're going to grow Thompson's for table fruit, in California at least, you have to have put it into this third category of, of 
growing it, of course, on canes as an overhead, ar I mean, cross arm arbor, and then do a lot of cluster thinning. I told you last time about how you thin them from 80 clusters or so down to 20 or 25. And then those that you leave, you've got to cut off the, the bottom half. So it's a, com a severe cluster thinning, remember, after bloom. And uh, the ones that you leave, then you will bury it thin as the term goes, which means cutting off part of the cluster. And then finally we get to one that perhaps is the, the one that requires the most thinning of all is perlette. This is the earliest table grape we have in California, perlette. And we would cordon train this and normal spur prune it. That is, we cordon it and then you, you, you leave the usual two to three buds. And then this variety sets a higher percentage of its flowers, I guess, than any other variety. Maybe, uh, maybe zonic current when it's girdling hormone sets more a uh, higher percentage of its flowers, but they're very small berries. But among the other varieties, perlet sets the highest percentage of its flowers into fruit, which means then that, of course, that you've got to, uh, two, two big operations after bloom is over, you've got to lighten the crop load by taking off some clusters. And then you have to do this berry thinning we're talking about. But instead of working uh, as you do with, let's say, with Thompson seedless, that comes down like this with a big long cluster and the framework down through here and your branches out like this. And we, with Thompson seedless, where all you do is just cut off Thompson or Tokay, you just cut off the bottom half. Uh, this variety is set so tightly, so completely, that you have to go in with, with picking shears and cut off individual little branchlets. You got to go in and cut this one out and then go in and cut this one out and cut this one out and so forth like this. That adds up to a little bit of work. Roughly 50 cents a vine for thinning. Well, why don't you do a flower cluster thing if you have so many flowers going into the stuff? Boy, I haven't gotten those, those last lecture and I have over at all, have I? Why do you do flower cluster thinning? Uh, to improve the stuff. <laughs> and our big problem here is that we've got a real set problem, so much set that we don't know what to do with it. So it, we only have to pay 50 cents a vine to get rid of the set. And you want a flower cluster thin and make it worse. So this is the problem. It figures out to roughly $200 an acre. At 500 vines an acre, say, and probably now it's $250 an acre. So it's 50 cents a vine just to thin the fruit on this variety. So it's an expensive variety to grow, and therefore, there's no point in trying to grow perlet on a commercial basis unless you're going to have a real profit margin. And the reason you can afford 50 cents a vine to thin it is that it's the first variety that comes in and often brings as much as uh, about 40 cents a pound on the wholesale market in New York, about $10 a lug box on the first ones that get in. So if you're getting, a, if you're getting, if you're getting a, a nearly a lug box per vine, which means that you're grossing about anywhere from eight to ten dollars a vine, gross, the fifty cents per vine for thinning doesn't seem so much. But if you move that up to uh, Arvin or to Fresno and grow it, and uh, pay fifty cents a vine to thin it and get four dollars a box for your grape, then uh, you've got a different card game. So that this, the, so Perlet fits into our California economic scheme only in Coachella Valley, or perhaps in Arizona, if you want to c think of Arizona also in this deal. And that's the most expensive one of all to, uh, to thin. It, it sets any, uh, up to over 30% of its individual flowers. And we figure that a normal set should be somewhere around 15 to 20% of the flowers to, to actually stay on and become fruit. Okay, that's the once over lightly to give you examples of, uh, of training and uh, thinning combinations on the table varieties. Let's go to raisin grapes. Head trained and cane pruned. Yeah, head trained and cane pruned to go in the vine row, that X or H shape in the vine row. 
But now let's go to Raisin Grapes and we'll hit Thompson Seedless from this standpoint. Yeah. Just, okay. Right. I said that I went to a great extent to show you know that you leave 10% extra crop at flower cluster thinning time, then remove that extra 10% and final adjustment after they bloom. Yeah. Now, when you go to raisin grapes, and of course we're speaking here mainly of Thompson, uh, the, well, of course we again head train it and cane prune it. But the rule of thumb is to load the vine up with as much fruit as you can put on it so that you can have 22 or 23 degree bowling by September 1 in California. That's the, that's the cardinal rule. Load it up, load up the Thompson seed that's being grown for raisins and carry as much fruit as you can on it by experience on your own vines or so that you can still get uh, bowling or, or bricks, we said we we're going to say, percent sugar of around 22 by the 1st of September. Remember I said if you overcrop them, you delay maturity, you delay sugar. But if you delay it past September 1st on getting this 22 degree bowling, then you got to back up next year and lighten your crop some. That's your main rule of thumb on this. Now why September 1? Well, we have found out after about 75 years experience that, that this is about the deadline on, on a gamble on whether or not you can get that fruit dry before the rains come. So you need about four weeks after you cut the raisins and put them on those paper trays for them to dry so you can pick them up. And any time after September the 1st, you've got to have four weeks to dry. And the longer you wait after September 1st to cut raisins, the more you're skating on thin ice the thinner the ice gets. <laughs> Did you say the head train? Head train, but cane prune. Yeah, yeah. That's what all those were out in the lab that you're working with. And uh, we say 22, 23 degree bowling, uh, bricks, percent sugar. But uh, actually in the industry right now, they're still selling when they, uh, uh, the raisins that are made from grapes at around 19 or 20 percent sugar. We don't recommend this, but as lo so long as uh, Grapes are $700 a ton. I guess people continue to buy them made out of grapes that are only 19% sugar. But ideally, we would like to say as a rule there that you should have 22% sugar on September 1 uh, on the uh, long-term gamble for quality and to avoid the danger of rain. Those of you, are there any raisin growers in the uh, uh, terms? How about, uh, uh, what is the, uh, government insurance on rain against raisins. They must have a dead cutoff date. You don't know. But there's, see, you can get government insurance uh, against rain damage on your grapes, but you have to meet certain specifications. And I'm sorry, I don't know what those are. But uh, if any of you are really interested, I could find out from uh, Dr. Nelson. OK, that's the, the main thing on Thompson's. And then the other thing about Thompson's, while we're talking about, we'll just throw it in here that if you're growing wine Thompsons, grapes, uh, Thompson seedless for wine, then you can leave them on, a, uh, you can leave them even more crop on because you don't have to pick them September 1. Of course, you're going to get lower quality because the longer you leave them on there, the uh, lower and lower and lower the acid goes down. But so long as the winers are buying them, why are you going to worry about it until they get around to paying you a premium? Isn't there a yield rate anyway? What's that? Yield duration, you know, adding acid. They're not at, oh, can the wineries add acid? Yeah, something like Thompson Seedless, I don't think they care about it. Well, you can add uh, uh, acid to it, but uh, uh, unfortunately, that for some reason, they don't do it. The best thing to do, of course, is uh, what a Bear Mountain winery does is to blend in French Columbar with the Thompson Seedless. French Columbar being a very high acid wine, they make a fairly good wine. In fact, I promised somebody who gave me a case of that that we'd have a wine tasting in this class and show you that you can make a decent or fairly drinkable white wine in the San Joaquin Valley. So one of these days before the course is over, we'll have a little wine tasting and taste this blend of Thompson Seedless with French Combar. But we're getting off the subject here. Anyway, the point being that uh, you can leave Thompson's on longer if you're growing them for wine until they get around to penalizing you for low acid on the Thompson's. Does that reduce the capacity though in the next couple of years? Well, I say, you, you, but uh, it, it will gradually if you really overdo it, but you can just overstep it by about one step 
and still get a heavier crop without weakening the vine too much. But it, um, you remember my overcropping lecture in which I said that if you practice this, you not only lead eventually to overcropping in terms of surplus grapes, but overcropping effects on the vine, so it's a little dangerous. But I'm just trying to, to relate the two things here of raisin production Thompson against wine production Thompson. That you've got a deadline that nature forces on you in the case of raisins, but uh, you can play your own ball game as far as the wine grapes are concerned. And then we go to Black Corinth then, which is the Zanny Current. And Zanny Current uh, is, can be either head trained with canes such as Thompson. In other words, it can either be similar to Thompson or if you can put it on cordon and long spur. This is to make those little, uh, that's Black Corinth, which uh, is more commonly known as Zanty Currents. It's not as a current at all, but for some reason it's referred to that. And here, you could either cane prune it. I think more, more people would say that you cordon it and long spur it in order to get the crop. And then finally, one final variety, which has very little importance, but someone always brings it up if I don't, is Manuka. And Manuka is uh, quite similar to Thompson Seedless. It's sort of a colored Thompson Seedless, but it's as vigorous as Thompson Seedless, so, but it's fruitful basal bud. So we would cordon it and long spur it. Cordon it and long spur it. <coughs> and if some of you want to know why we don't have more Manukas, it's because they shatter off too easily when they're ripe. So uh, it's a fairly nice grape. The health food stores make a big, big thing out of selling Manuka. It makes a great big raisin occasion a little touch of a residual seed in it but it's a nice looking raisin but there's no more health benefit to it than there is to eating thompson's but uh, the health stores make a big deal on it now just very quickly just to touch on the wine grapes remember we've told you several times these wine grapes as a general rule you can say that wine grapes uh, it's a matter of cost relationships and most wine grapes would be all right on head train and spur prune. If the economics are such that uh, they force you to that. But as you know, most of the wine grapes now are going either to cordon with the two vertical wires or cane prune with the two vertical wires as the minimum uh, compromise. And the ones which we would cane prune because of the small clusters are the Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, the, four, and the ones that we've talked about so much, Pinot Noir. Uh, this would include Gamay Beaujolais, which we call a synonym of, for Pinot Noir. This would be Gamay Beaujolais out here. And uh, White Riesling. And uh, Sauvignon Blanc. And Cabernet. These we would all, we would put on wire, uh, and the rest of them, if d these would put on wire as a really a requirement if you're going to make any real money off of them, but the rest of them uh, could be head trained and spur prune. All, practically all the rest of the wine varieties could fit into that category. Um, and your worst tremeanor up here. This would be, this would be, uh, these would be all cane pruned on, on the two wire vertical. Then we have a few varieties, of course, which are, are quite, quite vigorous. And uh, on the wine varieties, as you know, we would put um, varieties such as Carignan, Carignan, uh, Grenache, and Palomino. We would normally recommend these on cordon spur prune because they're large clustered varieties which tend to uh, give some trouble for bunch rot if you, if you head train them. And uh, any other outstanding one, Dr. Ali, that I've left to? We would also put Salvador, which some of you are not even, don't even have the biggest idea what it is, but Salvador is a red colored variety for the San Joaquin Valley and we would normally recommend it for cane pruning because of its small clusters. And I have uh, comments here on a whole lot of others, but uh, 
those give you some uh, uh, examples of, of uh, how we would treat them. Zinfandel, of course, as you know, we would head train and spur prune because of its weakness. And I guess that's where we have to stop for today. <laughs>